Good morning, women of power. Are you all enjoying this amazing conference? All right. First, I know you're all wondering, and yes, I too am wearing Macy's. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Danny Best, uh, Director of Global Diversity and Inclusion at Dell Technologies. And I am far from the only Dell Technologies representation here today. I'm thrilled to have brought 35 of our team members. Are, are, the, Dell, are the Dell Technologies Women of Power in the house? We are so honored and so proud to be a longtime partner of Black Enterprise. Black Enterprise is what we call a strategic partner. We work with them not only in inspiring events like this and on media opportunities, but also on recruitment of diverse talent. You may have read the headlines. We're in the midst of what's being called the fourth industrial revolution. This is a time when in some form or fashion, every industry is becoming a technology industry. Think about car manufacturers. Just a few decades ago, do you think they ever foresaw themselves needing computer scientists to develop autonomous vehicles? Probably not, but that's now our reality. It's awesome and it's inspiring to see rapid human progress technology is making possible. But that quick progress is also leading to a skill shortage. We're fighting over the same finite talent as technical skills become more important for more and more industries. According to the US Department of Labor, there will be 1.4 million open computer science jobs. In the US alone, we need to tap into the traditionally underrepresented, diverse sources of talent to address these skills shortages. We need more women, yes. <laughs> and we need more ethnic minorities to pursue careers in tech. We understand that no one company or one organization is going to solve the skills shortage challenge alone. And that's why we are honored to have partnerships like the one with Black Enterprise. At Dell Technologies, we have many irons in the fire, like Project Immersion, where we work with HBCUs and minority-serving institutions to provide them with curriculum and also to provide our employees as guest instructors. Or our bias check initiative, developing an AI solution to mitigate and eliminate bias in and along the employment continuum. Or, more importantly, Black Enterprise Be Smart Student Symposium, uh, where our partnership is that we're gonna bring our HBCU students to our Dell headquarters in Austin, Texas to engage with Dell leadership. Like I said, no one company is gonna solve this, these technical shortages all alone. And if you'd like to learn more, certainly reach out to me or the 35 women of power from Dell Technologies right here in the front. Thank you so much. We'd love to collaborate with you. Uh, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of this amazing conference. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to Dell once again for your continued partnership. Last year, our next feature guest, the former minority leader for the Georgia House of Representatives, made a historic run for governor of Georgia, where she garnered more votes than any Democrat in the history of the state. And though, she lost by a narrow margin. It served as a victory of immeasurable proportion. A few short months later, 
Stacey Abrams will not only become the face of the Democratic Party, but the first African-American woman to give the formal response to a presidential address, a response viewed by millions nationwide. It served as a testament to the power Democrats believe she holds to connect with a diverse electorate in a moment of American politics challenged by the complexities of race and gender. After witnessing the gross mismanagement of the election by the Secretary of State's office, this lifelong public servant and tireless champion of voting rights launched Fire Fight, her platform to ensure every Georgian has a voice in our election system. Others have also set a platform in motion Run, Stacey Run, to help develop Stacey Abrams for federal office in 2020. Our very own Caroline Clark has the honor of interviewing this extraordinary woman of power. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your best woman of power welcome to politician, lawyer, and yes, romance novelist, Stacey Abrams. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Starting off real slow this morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> so just for the record, before we say anything else, um, we know what the conclusion of the election was, but we also know who won. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And we know who's gonna keep winning, so there's that. Secondly, um, for the record, Danny's not the only person dressed by Macy's this morning. Stacy and I are both. <laughs> so, um, Valerie was talking about her book this morning. Mm -hmm. And if you do not have Stacey Abrams' book, um, Minority Leader, which came out last year, you need to get it, and you can get it anew because a new version of it is being released on March 26th. Correct, it's called Lead from the Outside. Lead from the Outside, and you can order it, pre-order it on Amazon um, starting today. And you should, I will tell you why. Minority Leader, um, I read constantly, as I know you do too. Um, and we're both writers. Stacy is all the things you already know she is, but if you didn't know, she's a phenomenal writer. And a lot of people write sort of self-help books and a lot of people write memoirs. And a lot of people try to combine them, but they don't end up being both. <laughs> this book will really tell you about Stacey's life, but it also really delivers on what its promise is, which is to teach you how to lead from the outside and make real change. Thank you. What is new about the new version of this book coming out? Well, I was writing the book when I was in the midst of running for office. This tells you what happened. Um, so there's a foreword that really talks about the campaign and the effect that it had on the way I think about this, and really that nothing changed. Um, as Caroline said, I didn't lose. I just didn't get to be governor. And, and part of what I talk about was the decision to do my non-concession speech, which upset a few people. Uh, but it was important to me to, to believe what I said in the book a year before. And in the, what I talk about in the book is that you embrace, you talk about your failures, you embrace your mistakes, but you also have to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth is harder than the lie. Because the lie is that you accept your fate and you move on and you try to preserve your opportunity for the next thing. Uh, when I decided to refuse to concede, there were a lot of folks who said I was done in politics because I wasn't being gracious enough and people wouldn't support me again. But for me, the responsibility is I'm not going to lie about what happened and I'm not going to pretend that something occurred that did not occur. We changed the electorate. We won that election. And, but more importantly, we uncovered or we didn't uncover it because we know it's been here forever, but what we were able to do in our campaign, unfortunately, was put on prominent display the theft of our democracy. 
And I can't say that I believe in public service and in America and then say it's okay to steal someone's vote. And so the forward, the forward really is about my coming to terms with the fact that sometimes you have to risk. You have to risk saying the truth to be truthful and honest to yourself and you can't make progress if you can't be honest with yourself. Now, luckily it worked out and I got to do the State of the Union response, but it could have gone horribly wrong. So <laughs> just know that that's the caveat. Uh, don't, you may not want to try this at home, but I think you should. So. <laughs> let's, let's just put this right here so that nobody forgets it. Um, let's talk about the State of the Union response. Uh, it was a historic moment. Um, and I want to know, we know what you said, and you did a fantastic job. I mean, really, nobody watches that usually. Everybody <laughs> watched it. Um, I want to know what got left on the cutting room floor. So, look, 10 minutes is not a lot of time. And part of what happens when you are tapped to give the speech is that everybody in America has an idea about what you're supposed to say. My mama had some things for me to say. <laughs> the barista had something for me to add. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I was at the store and they're like, aren't you doing that speech? You should talk about it. I'm like, yes, ma'am, I will see if I can get it in there. Um, but I was actually privileged. They let me write my own speech. Often those speeches are written for you, and, and that makes it difficult to deliver. They were, kind, you know, they were invested enough in me that they let me write my own speech, and they'd heard me speak before, so, you know, Leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi were cool. <laughs> they were like, you, you can do it. Uh, but I got to say everything I wanted to say. I may have added more detail and more color to it, but fundamentally I got to talk about what I wanted to talk about, which is that we are angry as a, as a people, we are angry as a nation, we are saddened by the things we see happening, but we are stronger than any one person. And that there is no way the core of who we are can be eroded by four years of mismanagement. Um, that, that's not, that doesn't happen. And that there's a recent enough example of greatness that we remember what it looks like, we just have to look for it again. Um, what did election week feel like? You know, we watched it from a distance. Um, if you're like me, you got the daily emails from your campaign. You meant um, hourly? <laughs> well, okay, I was trying to cut you a break on that. But yeah, there were a lot of emails, um, and they did a, a really good job. I have to say your team is amazing, um, and, and they did a good job of sort of keeping us hanging in there. But I mean, I really can't imagine how that felt from the inside by only the one person, right? Because you have a team, but at the end of the day, this was you, this was your name, this was your future, this was your life. And you've invested so much into this. Take us there. So the week before the election, Georgia has 20, roughly 21 days of early voting uh, where you can go in person and cast your ballots. We, as a team, had built the single largest voter protection process in the state's history. We were in every region of the state, we were in most counties, and we did not take any community for granted. Uh, one of the most important things about the campaign was that we were truly a diverse campaign. We had every community represented, not just in the campaign, but in the leadership, uh, which was important because cultural competence is how you get people to believe that you see them and that their votes matter. Uh, but we also knew that I needed to be the person that people, was, that people could see. And so while we were getting this incredible energy on the ground, this woman named Oprah came in to say hi to us. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nearly made me crash my car when she called. Uh, I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we got pulled over to the side of the road. Uh, so we had extraordinary support. President Obama came in. So we had these amazing highs, but at the same time, we were getting reports from around the state of people going to vote, finding that their names had been taken off the rolls, that they'd been unlawfully purged. We were hearing stories about absentee ballots being rejected because the signature did not match the signature on their uh, driver's license. Look, my signature isn't the same from Kroger to CVS. <laughs> and people were being told <laughs> your votes don't count because you, you don't have the same signature you had when you were 17. Uh, we had, we were getting these terrible stories and 
there was a smugness about our opponent who was saying that you know, he knew that this was gonna be okay. And it, you know, it's foreshadowing. And so there was this moment where I'm excited, I'm moving, we were on the road every day. Chelsea Hall, who's my special assistant, you know, she was riding shotgun with me across the state and we were going into communities and to places where they'd never seen a politician. I mean, it was, it was energizing and it was exciting and it was panic inducing because people's hopes were so high. And to, to have that much, not vested in me, particularly, but in what we were talking about, people understanding that with my success, they would have access to healthcare for the first time. Their child wouldn't be thrown into jail and never have a thought of coming out. They would have access to education and to economic development. Those were real things that we talked about. And there was a sense of ownership. I mean, literally people would grab me like they own me. Like, and by the way, Stacy, I'm like, I don't know you, please let my arm go. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, but it was wonderful because people wanted to be a part of it and they believed that it would work. And so I believed and we fought. And then to get to election day, we were in South Georgia. We actually went to seven different communities. We started in Savannah, went across South Georgia and then back up to Atlanta on election day. And along the way, we started hearing reports of long lines of polling places that only had one machine for a thousand people voting. By the time we got back to Atlanta, there have been people who've been in line for four hours. Uh, we were hearing about uh, some polling places had machines, but they didn't have the power cords. And for black communities, they were facing the harshest of the voter suppression methods. And I started getting worried, but I, was, I believed in what we had done. I believed in our democracy. And so by the time we got to the, the results coming in, we were performing better than we had imagined. We were going for 1.5 million voters. That would have helped us catapult over my predecessor who ran for governor who got 1.1 million. We were at 1.9 million votes by the end of the day, the most votes of any Democrat in Georgia history. And yet, we knew that thousands of people had been turned away from their polling places. In the Atlanta University Center, they turned away so many students that we had to go to court. They were cherry picking who got to have a provisional ballot based on whether someone looked like they should be allowed to vote. We had areas of the state where they, we had to sue to get the polling places open for extra hours. And those are just the things we knew about. Between election day and the day of the non-concession speech, we got more than 50,000 phone calls of individual examples of voter suppression. And I lost that election by 54,000 votes. We know that if 50,000 people took the time to call, 50,000 more didn't know they could call, and 50,000 more didn't know they needed to call. And so that's a very long way of saying I was angry, sad, excited. I contained all of the emotions. I was kind of like inside out in a person. Right. Um, the whole movie all at once. So, I think we've all been there sometime. <laughs> but this is what I want to know. So you, you said the words earlier, it was panic inducing, yes. right? And you used the words anger and, and afraid and disappointed. Um, how did you, because even through feeling all of those things, you're showing up for your team, you're leading a team, you're leading a massive and growing constituency of people who you said is personally invested in you. I know you had money coming into your campaign from people who had never ever plunked a dime in a piggy bank for anybody ever. Um, so how did you continue to lead through that and to lead yourself all the way to what I love is now in the lexicon, a non-concession speech? I, I'm the daughter of Methodist ministers. Um, their job is to save people's souls. I'm like, good luck with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know Bishop McKenzie was here. And you, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> but before they were ministers, my parents were civil rights activists as children, I mean, as young people. And they raised us to understand you don't solve every problem. 
You don't fix every issue. They will not know if they were successful until judgment day. But what my parents raised, is they, they said, your, your job isn't to fix, your job is to fight. If you're trying to fix everything and you're only happy when it's done, then you're only working on small problems. If your job is to fight, then it's the persistence of action that you use to judge your success. I did not become governor, but I changed the electorate of Georgia. We did. There, there are five stats I like to give. We tripled the number of Latino voters in Georgia. We tripled the number of Asian Pacific Islanders. We increased youth participation rates by 139%. In 2014, 1.1 million Democrats voted in that election. In 2018, 1.2 million black people voted for me. More than the sum total. We, we did that by centering communities of color, by talking about mar the marginalized, by lifting up their issues, and we were told that by doing so, we would lose white voters. In 2004, John Kerry got 23% of the white vote in Georgia. 2008, President Obama got 23% of the white vote. Hillary Clinton got 21% of the white vote. Some people got confused and voted for Jill Stein. <laughs> in my election, I got 25% of the white vote in the state of Georgia. And and so the ability to be persistent is grounded in a joy of knowing that we actually did what we came to do. We changed the electorate, we engaged communities. People who didn't believe in voting, did not believe that their voices mattered. They saw someone who was fighting for them and because of that, they still stop me on the streets and say, I'm there with you the next time. Because the worst outcome is when voter suppression works not only by stealing an election, but by stealing people's belief and their hope. It works when they stay home because they think the system is too rigged. People aren't despondent, they're angry. And anger leads to action, and that's why it's worth for me to keep fighting. You know, I think um, we all have our opponents, right? Um, I don't mention certain names. I don't mention the name of the person who lives in the White House now, generally. Um, and I don't mention your opponent's name, because I just get too angry when I say those names. But I think um, we all have our opponents, right? Mm -hmm. And as you did this, so, so much of how we proceed through success, failure, all of it, um, that can sidetrack us is personalizing things. Um, to what degree, because this was huge on a personal level, right? To what degree did you personalize and sort of manage your opponent in your head? And do you think of opponents, and this one in particular, in terms of good and evil, right and wrong? You know, how do you work that equation out in your head? Oh, I per it's personal. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but, but, but here's why. He spent a decade constructing an architecture of voter suppression that stole an election. Now, I'm not saying I can prove I would have won, but it's a really good guess. But he did everything in his power to yoke together different forms of voter suppression. It wasn't just that he, he denied registration to 53,000, 90% of whom were people of color, 70% of whom were black. He purged 1.5 million people from the rolls, including 600,000 right before he threw his name into the ring to, to run for governor. He, he oversaw the closure of 200 precincts, most of which were in low-income and black communities. He denied responsibility for making sure that the counties were effectively counting votes and said it wasn't his job, even though his job is state elections official. He used the exact match system to discount and deny the right to vote and the right to register. He told naturalized citizens they had to turn in information that they were federally prohibited from turning in. He did every single part of the voter suppression playbook and he started a decade ago. He and I got to know each other because he accused me of voter fraud because I signed up 86,000 black and brown people to vote. In 2014, he subpoenaed me, I sued him, and we've been at it ever since. <laughs> and so there, there really is a personalization to this. 
my person believes that we should all have the right to vote. His person does not. His sense of our communities says that our voices should not matter as much as his ambition matters. That's personal. Now, if I focus on, you know, so go all, you know, Marvel superhero and focus on his destruction, that's a problem. It could be fun, but it's a problem. <laughs> My responsibility is to deconstruct what he has built and then to build something even stronger that he can't defeat. And that's how I think about it. Okay. I hope somebody wrote that down, because I'm going to need it <laughs> later. Um, so let's go a little lighter. Yes. <laughs> Throughout this journey, which, um, which has been a long time coming for you, Valerie talked earlier about having had a 10-year plan coming out of college. <laughs> did you have a 10-year plan coming out of college? My plan, uh, which I talk about in the book, I did a spreadsheet when I was 18 that took me to the age of 64, 68. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so you're I, not a planner. I, no, no. <laughs> not a planner. Just winging it, huh? <laughs> Look, I, I was so serious. I did this on Lotus 1, 2, 3 before Excel. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell us, what, what was on your little spreadsheet, Stacey? So. There are three columns. <laughs> there is personal, professional, and then aspirational. So eventually there's this job I want to have. Uh, now do not react. There's this job in DC that uh, looks really good. And <laughs> yes! You all do not take instruction well at all. So you're, you're talking so. about head of the African American Museum. Exactly, that one? exactly. Right, right. Now look, I want to be. I, you're not supposed to. <laughs> so, so much like the non-concession speech, you are taught in politics that it is unseemly to declare ambition. I think that's stupid. I think that it is, it is one of the ways we diminish the agency, especially of black women, because we're told not to declare what we want. Well, if you don't declare what you want, how are you ever gonna get there? Right. Now, I would love to be president of the United States one day, but for me, there are other jobs I want because I want to do the work of those jobs. And having this ultimate goal does not diminish the credibility and the urgency and the sincerity of the other jobs I want to have. And so I, I got a little bit of flack the first time someone learned that I might, as a politician, want the top job. No one would ever look at the person who's working in the, who's the you know, secretary who says, I want to be CEO and be like, don't you dare have that ambition. Well, I would like to be in charge of all the stuff, so yes. <laughs> um, and so, so my spreadsheet had that as the goal, and so I worked backwards. What are the things I need to do? Now, I didn't know I wanted to be president when I was in college because the biggest job I'd ever seen a black woman hold, uh, there had been a few mayors in smaller towns. It wasn't until 2003 that Shirley Franklin became mayor of, of Atlanta. And as I saw more achievement possible, I mean, I knew that Shirley Chisholm had run for president, but I also knew that she hadn't been successful. But it was worth the idea. And so over time, I would adjust my spreadsheet. It has a little algorithm that adjusts based on who wins an election. <laughs> I, I really do take these things seriously. Um, so there's my business goal. So there's the, the sort of aspirational goals, and then they're professional. So it's when I decided I was going to be a lawyer, I figured out what I would need to do to be successful in that and what that work would look like. I knew I wanted to make some money. I was not as good at that as I thought I would be, um, but I laid out the metrics. And then I had a personal goal, um, things I wanted to do for my life. I am terrible at dating. Uh, I did not know that when I was 18. Um, <laughs> but what I figured out is that, that I have to give as much intention and attention to my personal life as I do to everything else, and, and that's gonna be something I work on now. Um, 
now mind you, I started the spreadsheet because I broke up with a boy who was really ugly to me and I, wrote, I did my spreadsheet mainly out of revenge. I'm like, oh, I'll show you. Um, <laughs> but it works. Uh, <laughs> again, turn your anger into action. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, for me, it's, it's about having a sense of where you want to be and it's living by design. And for me, the design isn't so hardened that it can't be adjusted. Like I did not intend to lose the race for governor, but I, my backup plan, I thought it was binary. Either I'd be governor or, or I would not. I did not imagine that I would be falling up as fast as I did. And, and that has taken some adjustment and I, I haven't figured out what I'm gonna do with it yet. But I think the, the point for me is the planning gives me guide rails. It helps me figure out sort of where am I trying to get so that the things coming at me, whether known or unknown, don't, they sway me, but they don't distract me. Um, if you know where you're trying to get to, all the other good or bad things that come at you can inform, but they don't have to destroy. And that's really the opportunity, and that's the challenge of living by design. But you gotta make sure that the, the default setting doesn't come, become, you're doing it just because it is, it's you're doing it because it makes sense within the larger construct of what you have for your life. Right, right. Um, we're gonna open up for questions in five minutes. So I'm telling you now so that when we're ready to go, there's somebody standing at the mic and we should have time for about five questions. There are two mics here and here. Um, and do not ask me what I'm doing next. <laughs> save, save that question, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> so yesterday, uh, Kamala Harris was here and you know, I think your race, while clearly her race is, is historical, um, your race in a way was a precursor. Um, Shirley Chisholm always came to mind for me when I, when I watched you run. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, it's such an endurance test, physically, mentally, spiritually, intellectually, um, you know, we know sort of long-term what your spreadsheet goals are and Kamala's, you know, where she is now. What advice would you give her as she takes on this run, this race, in this environment, in this place, right now, the way we are? I mean, first is know who your friends are. Um, and, and I mean this in a very sincere way. Your friends are the people who were with you before you decided to do this. Now, you have a lot of, of good people who learn about you and come to you, but friends are the ones who knew about you before and who were there when it was hard and are there when it's done. And those are the people who you can lean on and turn to, and they're the ones you can call and say, I'm hungry and there's no food in my house, can you help me? You know, you want, that, you want to know who those people are. And I think, I think she has just extraordinary people around her, but it's, it's knowing that. And those are the people who tell you the truth. They do, they, they tell you that, that, that doesn't look good on you, do not wear it again. <laughs> they, they will tell you. They, they tell you that, yes, you know, you shouldn't have said it quite that way, but they say it nicely and they don't say it right after you mess up. They give you a couple of days. Um, <laughs> but they also ask how you are and they mean it. They, they mean not only how are you, but how can I help you be better? And that matters. It is, it is great that people care about you, but you see that care taken when people turn to you and say, what can I do? I, we have a mutual friend who's a high-powered attorney um, who worked with me, has been friends with me for years, and she has way too many important things to do, but she showed up at my house with three containers of freezable soup. And it was in the last few weeks of the campaign, and it was because she was like, when do you go to the grocery store? I'm like, I don't. I don't even know if my stove still works. <laughs> and she said, just put this in the freezer, and she divided it into little containers, and it was really good. I didn't know she could cook either. Um, <laughs> Spelman women Spelman, can do everything. They can, exactly. but it meant something to me <laughs> that in the midst of everything where people are trying to help me with these really high issues, she understood that I rarely remembered to get food, so she, and so I was eating crap. And so she brought me something that was for my body, but also it filled my spirit. Like, that's important. Um, and then the other part of it is you want to remember who you are. Like, I have brother, I'm the second of six kids. My siblings were incredibly excited about my campaign and they did not care that I was on the cover of Time Magazine. They celebrated it and then they said, did you remember to do this thing you're supposed to do? <laughs> um, 
you want people who remind you of all of who you are and who keep you grounded in that and who do not let you take yourself too seriously. Uh, as excited and as, as wonderful as being on the stage is, I've got a text waiting for my mother because she needs me to type something for her when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's that's the kind of grounding you always need. Yeah, yeah. Um, first question. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to hear from you today. My name is Laura Roan, all the way from Philadelphia. And woo, Philly in the house. Um, I am a business owner as well, and I'm a financial advisor, insurance broker. And I just want to ask you personally, on the night when you, when you found out that things didn't go your way, I would like for you to take us through that, some of that emotional journey you went through because that just helps because we all have to go through that. Maybe not at that level, <laughs> but we all have to manage our own morale. We all have to work for ourselves and encourage ourselves. So how did you make that work for you? Thank so you. thank you for that question. So that night, I have some very good friends who are also running campaigns on November 6th who immediately when the results came in, they conceded. They said, okay, we accept this. I was in the hotel room with my family and some dear friends had flown in, my campaign manager. And what I love about Lauren Growargo, who was my campaign manager, is that she and I went to the back and we didn't talk about how do I, we, we first were both very upset because of the numbers and because of the reports we were getting. And there's this moment where part of the reason you concede is you just want it to be over. You want there to be closure. You want it to be done because you are on the most public stage possible. And you just want to go lick your wounds. I was sad. I was angry. But I was also not convinced. And when Lauren and I talked, where we got to almost immediately was that this wasn't about me. If my decision about the next step was about how I would feel and what I needed, then I was doing all of this wrong. And so instead, I made myself take a step back and like, why are you doing this? What is upsetting? Like, there are people who, who tried to vote and they did not have their votes counted. And we don't know if their votes will count. And you have, I have this national stage. I could walk outside and stand on the stage and every television camera in the United States, the UK, and Canada was watching. And apparently down in the islands too, because when I tried to go down there for vacation, it did not work. Um, <laughs> and so for me, it was the, the, the emotion was first personal anguish, but then it was if I truly believe my job to be enlarging the capacity of others, how do I do that? And in that moment, that meant that I went on stage and said, we're gonna to fight to make sure every vote gets counted. We'll deal with my personal issues later, but right now we've got to fight for other people. And in the moment that you do that, the tears don't stop, but they slow. Because um, I'm still sad. I'm still angry. I don't know if there's enough therapy or Xanax to solve any of those things. <laughs> By the way, I don't do Xanax, but just because that's it's gonna show up in People Magazine, Stacey Abrams. Anyway. <laughs> But my, my point being, the, you don't get over, you get through. And that's the most important part. We have a question here. Just please ask your questions as quickly as possible so we can get to as many as possible. Yes, ma'am. I'm Adrian Allen here with my Accenture family. <laughs> Greetings from Georgia. Yes. So my question is very similar to hers, but more specific. With the stigma of the angry black woman, it would be, I'm curious to know the conversation you had with yourself about how to not concede and not come across as just the angry black woman. You can't, the stereotypes are there. And I'd already leaned into every, I'm a natural haired, heavy set black woman with rich mocha skin and a gap. <laughs> You can't miss me, so <laughs> I figured out you just lean into it. So 
and, and, and anger is a righteous emotion when it's grounded in a true, a true offense. But the, the issue isn't, are you angry? It's how do you express that anger? Typically what they mean by angry black women is that we somehow go outside of the, the normative standards of behavior, that we're loud, that we are destructive. Sometimes that's what you need to do. But in my case, my anger is that I've set up a multi-million dollar organization that is going to dismantle voter suppression in the state of Georgia, and that's a good and righteous anger, and I'm good with that. Fair fight, fair fight. It's called fair fight action. Fair fight action. But, but even in that moment, I wanted people to see my anger, but I also wanted them to see my smile. If you go back to that night on November 6th, I was wearing a really great dress, <laughs> and I smiled. Because again, voter suppression works, oppression works when it, when it crushes your spirit. And if anger or excitement, whatever the emotion is, if it keeps you moving, then lean into it. Don't let it undermine you, but let it galvanize you. That's what I try to do. Thank you. Good morning. Kind of short, so. You're good. Hi, Stacey. My name is Misa. I work with Act Blue, so I'm a huge Hi. fan. Um, and thank you guys for what you did. Yeah. Um, so in my current role, I work with Southern campaigns and candidates, and I'm trying to focus specifically on folks working in the rural South. What advice do you have for folks who are inspired by your courage and your work and who are struggling with the lack of institutional support? So part of what we had to do, you know, people talk about my campaign as though it started in 2018. I started this work back in 2010 when I became minority leader. Part of it was I had to build, I had to build the machinery of a party for us because we'd been in the weeds and in the wilderness for so long. But the most important thing we were able to do was that we went everywhere. We showed up in places no one showed up. So Fort Valley is a small town in, in Georgia. Tracy Ellis Ross, Uzo Adubo, Aisha Hines, and Rashida Jones came down to help with my campaign. I did not leave them in Atlanta. I took them to Fort Valley. I took them to Macon. We went to rural small places where people did not feel seen. If you want to build institutional capacity, go and find the people there who've been toiling in the vineyards and just don't know who else is doing it. A lot of the work is simply connecting the dots for people but it's also making sure they know that someone who has resources and information can see them. Because you don't have to build a Chicago machine to win a rural race. Sometimes you need 250 and you know, a good candidate who can spell their name the same way twice. And it, but it, it's creating the space so that, those, that they believe that there is something possible and that there's a plan for how they get there. Institutional capacity comes about by linking together individual pieces to create something that seems stronger than it is. And that's the work that you could do very easily. And especially in the rural South, because the bar is so low and the needs are so immediate that small victories are seismic. Next question. Hi, Stacy. my name is Yvette Ellis. I'm in sixth district in Georgia. Yes. Can I, <laughs> book six. Can I also just say that this type of authentic leadership cannot be coached? Like exactly. at all, you're amazing, Stacey, exactly. you're amazing. So, so speaking of authentic leadership in corporate America, sometimes we struggle with trying to find a balance of being our authentic selves uh, while still similar to politics, right? Mm -hmm. Having to influence very diverse audience. And so can you give some advice on sure. remaining our authentic selves even sure. in corporate America? Absolutely. So I wrote Minority Leader not just from the perspective of being in politics. I was in business. I was a tax attorney. I was a small business owner. And I talk about a moment with my business partner where we were at a meeting, um, and she's a white woman, and the, our clients kept talking to her thinking I was the secretary. I'm like, no, we're partners. That means we're equal. And we had to have a conversation after one of those meetings because she didn't notice what I was seeing. And it wasn't her. It was simply she didn't have the, the language to describe the experiences I was having. My first job was to tell her. And it was a good conversation and we talked about it. And we talked about what we needed to do going forward, that we needed to credential me in those meetings. And what I said is, look, you and I know we're equal, but for them, they don't see that and they don't expect that. So you have to take the lead 
and say that because if I say it, they're going to overlook it. If you say it, it has credibility. Um, the second is that we worked very closely to kind of figure out where are the places where I would be the only one there. Uh, because sometimes being your authentic self is being the only thing they can deal with. Uh, it's easier when there's a buffer. And sometimes the, the hard, courageous thing is to take it on and be the only thing they can, they can see and can address. But the third is that you also have to hold your clients accountable and your relationships accountable. Again, I didn't change, I've had natural hair since college, mainly because I'm lazy and I hate doing my hair. <laughs> I don't, I don't like it at all. But I've had to find ways to make people we have to acknowledge what it is they're uncomfortable with. And so sometimes it's having those hard conversations. What is it about me that's concerning to you? And l listen, see if there are parts that are legitimate concerns. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's that you, are, it's not that you're a bad dresser, it's that you are too free with your body parts and people, and you're just, they're not ready to see all of you. But, un <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> have the conversation <laughs> to create space so you can take in the information. But then fundamentally, you've got to give, there's a hierarchy of what you can accept and what you can't accept. What are you willing to adapt? Because all of, all of, human, com, all of human engagement is compromise. We all compromise parts of who we are and what we want because we've got to live in the space with someone else. And I don't get to do everything I want just because it's my authentic self because I want a job and I like living inside my house and not on the street. <laughs> and so it's being really clear with yourself, what are the parts that you can compromise? What are the things that are indelible to you versus the things you just really like? I am, despite this very engaged conversation because Caroline's good, I'm an introvert. And in the Capitol, I got in a lot of trouble because I'm not a glad handing politician. I also don't drink, which means I miss like two thirds of what people do. And so I had to find new ways to adapt to who they are because they shouldn't have to change their experiences simply to accommodate me. And so part of this is the personal responsibility of deciding how much of this is who you are and how much of this is what you want. Who you are, you should fight for. What you want, that's negotiable. Next question for Hansen. Uh, Stacey, you're amazing. Thank you. You've obviously uh, created, uh, first of all, my name is Kimmy Armour, <laughs> Oakland, California, by way of Chicago. Um, Macy's alum. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm a product executive, product and development uh, executive. So you've obviously created an amazing blueprint. So run, Stacey, run. Um, but as you do, what will be the plan to coalesce our white sisters because they truly changed the result of the last election. Our sisters were here. We did our job, even if the candidate wasn't the one that we really wanted. So what will that message be? What will your blueprint look like for that room that white women hold? How will you engage them? Sure. So I, I, wanna, I wanna correct the record on something. Yes, white women did not vote for Hillary, but a lot of people didn't vote at all. And attributing responsibility to one specific cohort means we got to hold every specific cohort responsible. In our campaign, we increased black men. We increased the percentage of black men who turned out by almost double. That meant the last time they voted, only half of them, only half of the eligible group had turned out. And so it's important that we ascribe responsibility appropriately, but we don't exonerate anyone. And so part of what we did in our campaign is that we talked to everybody, but we invested a commensurate amount based on the likelihood of their participation. So I was on country music radio and on urban radio, but I did not spend as much on country music radio. We also have to understand that in politics, race is the strongest predictor of political leanings. Education is next, not gender. And because of that, there are things like religion and they're, they're, they're ideological traits that are embedded in race and race experiences that just aren't mutable. 
And so it doesn't mean you ignore those communities, but you also don't put so much onus on that community knowing it's not going to change. Black women are unlikely to vote Republican because we have really good memories. Okay? But we also have sisters who don't show up. We have brothers who don't show up. We have Latino and Asian Pacific Islander allies who don't show up. And part of that is because no one bothers to ask because the presumption orients itself in politics around white voters. And the tendency is to see white voters as the normative standard and everyone else is either gonna do it because they have to or they, we just disregard them. What we did differently in our campaign is we went after every single vote. But when somebody told me no, I believe them. And if what they said is yes, I'll vote for you if you change your values, I said, thank you so much, I'll talk to you later. We win when we stand in our values and give those who share our values a reason to vote. That is how we get the people, because there are white women who share our values, but no one comes to them because they are single white women living in trailer parks, and we skip over those communities. So we've got to go and find the white women and the black men and the brown and other folks who share our values, and we have to treat them with respect and invest in their votes early, often, in every single one of you. Voter suppression targets people of color, but it hits everyone. And so we also have to understand that if we want to get those votes, people didn't vote in Milwaukee because they were living under a regime under Scott Walker that made it hard to vote. They didn't vote in Michigan because Brian Snyder as governor made it harder to vote. We didn't vote in, I don't know what happened, whoever was from Philly, I don't know what happened to y'all. But... <laughs> So I'm gonna wrap it up by saying this. The responsibility is that we cannot hold any one community responsible because people don't just vote based on their race, but our race experiences inform our value sets. And so we have to focus on the values if we want to turn out more voters. I'll go really fast if you're... Okay. Did you want to? Okay. I apologize for my very long-winded answers to everybody. <laughs> so thank you guys. So I just want to say, um, I'm sorry, again, we don't have time for more questions. One of the things in your book I love, you talk about work-life Jenga. Yes. Not work-life balance. You said you're going to be focusing on your personal column as you go through. Um, but tell, just quickly talk to us about Jenga and why it's Jenga and how you're going to do this now. So uh, here's the thing. Work-life balance is a lie. It is a bald-faced lie. I believe in work-life Jenga. You got Jenga, the game where you pull out the little blocks. You stack it and then you stack you things up. Pull them Work out. life Jenga means that you have to figure out which is the piece that you can pull out, which is the thing you can do, and you have to understand that when you pull it, you may destroy the whole tower. But the great thing about Jenga is that you can just rebuild the tower. And so for me, I'm going to try, I'm working on being healthier, I'm working on spending more time with me, actually going outside because apparently no one's coming to knock on my door to ask me out. Uh, you're never home. They I, might there, be there, you there go. right now. There you see, Carolyn. I'm, I'm just saying, okay. Stacey, you're never home. That is true. <laughs> um, but what I would say to all of you is the work-life Jenga is a responsibility. We have to prioritize the things that bring us joy and the things that make us stronger. And that can happen in your personal life, your professional life, your, your civic life. But the responsibility overall is to live the best life possible. And that means giving space for all of those things to be true. Thank you so much, and thank you. I want to say, I want to say, I want to say, Stacy's not dancing out because she hurt her knee. Yes. Okay, so we just know that. Otherwise, but we're dancing in our heads. We don't know where you're going. I'm gonna do the going. church lady. We don't know where you're going, but we're coming. We're thank coming you. with you. Thank, thank you, guys. Awesome.